everyone to uh, this session as we are on a tight schedule, even though some participants are still entering the session, we will start. Uh, we will leave the opportunity uh, for my introduction uh, in order to let people come in as, uh, as they come. So only as uh, an introduction, Open Science has and will continue uh, to be one of the major policy priority of the European Commission. So I will not go in depth uh, in defining what is Open Science and how the European Commission has been committed towards the dissemination of knowledge to address uh, global challenges, as I am sure that this topic will be covered by the impressive speakers uh, taking part to this roundtable dedicating to Open Science today. Before introducing them one by one, let me thank them on behalf of Ulysseus for their participation today and for accepting to share with our community not only their expertise, but also their experience and knowledge, as we are absolutely convinced uh, that it will help us design and implement an ambitious yet necessary strategy in terms of open science for our European university. Indeed, uh, Ulysseus is committed to participate to the overall efforts to support open science practices and policy making uh, at all levels. And actually, it's no coincidence that we have decided to devote a significant part uh, to open science in our COMPASS project, a project that is funded by the European Commission through, uh, well, H2020, now Horizon Europe, uh, which will be dedicated to the design of the UDCU's research and innovation strategy. With no further ado, I would like to introduce our speakers today. So first, Costas Guinius. Uh, so he is head of uh, the unit dedicated to open science at the Directorate General for Research and Innovation of the European Commission. So he will be presenting the ambition of uh, the EU open science policy and how it will translate throughout Horizon Europe, leading to a discussion on how Open Research Europe, ORE, and will actually uh, uh, be supported by Ulysseus and uh, will be helpful within the satellite project uh, throughout, uh, throughout the Alliance. Sylvie Rousset, who uh, is a director of the Scientific and Technical Information Department of the French National Center for Scientific Research, the CNRS, so she will present the ambition and priorities of the CNRS Open Research Data Directorate in terms of open science. Uh, then we will have uh, the pleasure of listening to Alexander Beresko. So he's the coordinator of the Optima project uh, and uh, he is from the Lviv Polytechnic National University in Ukraine. And he will be presenting the open practices, transparency and integrity of modern academia, Optima, project and its impact on PhD training and skills. Finally, uh, myself, who will be presenting on behalf of my colleagues, the Open Science Charter adopted by UCA. I believe my introduction was long enough, so I will leave the floor to the real experts with our first speaker, Kostas Yes, Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Saran, for the nice introduction. Um, so I will be uh, taking you through a number of points that have to do with open science policy overall at the European Commission. What is open science? Why do we need it? What are the expectations? And then briefly about uh, open science within the uh, uh, European research area as uh, presented in the uh, communication that the Commission made uh, last uh, September. And finally, uh, how do, what do we do about open science in Horizon Europe? Next one, please. So what is open science? Um, open science is about the, a process of sharing knowledge and data as early as possible in the research process in open collaboration with all knowledge actors. So it is about, it's a process, it's a way of doing science. Uh, the uh, all knowledge actors means of course, uh, researchers, means institutions, uh, but also means society and citizens. So in, uh, in, um, uh, it is inclusive, it is open not only to uh, scientists to one another or researchers to one another, but also institutions to one another, disciplines to one another, and between science and society. 
Uh, if we want to advance open science, we need appropriate policies. Uh, we need also uh, policies that are at all levels. So at the institutional level of each university, each research center, at the funders level, at the state level very often, and uh, now more and more we have open science policy being developed at the international level. I have participated in the last uh, few days, and this continues today and tomorrow in the UNESCO um, the meeting of, for agreeing an open science recommendation, which uh, they, will, uh, they will finalize by the end of the year, just to show you how international uh, open science uh, is quickly becoming. Uh, we uh, policies uh, development for open science means also that we will need to incentivize if we want really the application of open science uh, across all domains. We need to incentivize and to reward uh, open science, the openness of knowledge, uh, as well as the collaboration, incentivize the collaboration and the sharing of uh, data uh, and other scientific knowledge. Science and research um, have not made yet or have not completed their digital transition. Uh, the uh, many other uh, areas of uh, daily activity, like the uh, if you look at the area of media or of, uh, commerce, or they have changed completely. Automotive, uh, transport, many areas, their nature has entirely changed because of digital technologies. In uh, in uh, uh, research and in science, we use a lot IT. But the process itself has changed only marginally. The, uh, we use information technology to accelerate the existing processes. We use it to be able to access results of research, to uh, find uh, data publications and so on. But the process itself remains more or less as it has been uh, in, the, in the recent past. We think that the digital transition will change also the nature of the process itself. Uh, what are the obstacles for this happening? It is firstly, we have information flows in the research system, in the science system that are in, still impeded for different reasons. For example, uh, we know that the um, publication uh, model is still largely, not entirely, but largely the old model, uh, subscription-based. Uh, there is no open access to all scientific knowledge. We know also that uh, the big uh, majority of the data that are being produced are not findable. Even if you have the necessary tools and so on, you cannot find them. Uh, when, when you find them, very often you cannot access them. For example, they are closed. Uh, the, they are not, many of them, most of them actually, do not have clear licensing terms, so cannot be reused. Uh, and uh, very often, as we also saw uh, and we daily discover in the pandemic, in the COVID-19, they are not interoperable. Uh, part of this has to do with the lack of infrastructure uh, through which to uh, be able to access scientific knowledge. Uh, part of it has to do with the lack, as I said earlier, of appropriate incentives and rewards that will incentivize uh, scientists, scientific communities and institutions to share their research. And uh, also this uh, touches upon the uh, problem, the issue of um, science society relations. Uh, these are uh, uh, not always the, um, uh, the, the best they could be. Uh, we see today uh, a lot, which has actually been uh, eased up a little bit by the COVID-19 pandemic, but um, we see a lot of skepticism in parts of society considering science or scientists as uh, the elite uh, or that cannot necessarily be trusted. And this is a phenomenon that it is, um, that we see across uh, almost all countries in the world and, so, uh, and science being perceived as an ivory tower that it is separate from society. To the extent that society or states, if you want to continue to fund in the open science and the future and science wants to be part and benefit society, this is open science will really will contribute in uh, changing this perception of uh, science being away from the lives of the um, everyday citizens. So what are the expectations? Why are we doing all this? We're not doing it just because it's an inevitability that science becomes digital, although it is, I think. Um, but it, we don't do it for reasons of ideology because it's better to be open than being closed. Maybe it's true also, but that's not the reason. 
we're doing it because we know or we, we believe that uh, science, that open science is more efficient, will be more efficient because of much better sourcing, uh, sharing and exploitation of the resources, the knowledge resources that are available. Uh, we know that it's going to be more reliable, more robust, more reproducible. I'll talk about reproducibility in a second by opening itself up to scrutiny by everybody will be more responsive to societal de uh, demands by uh, coming closer to people, to the citizen, by involving societal actors, and therefore uh, will be more trusted by society. COVID-19 has been a very interesting um, experience uh, in terms of open science, uh, demonstrating its necessity and its success, not complete success, uh, but, uh, but limited success, but where it has been applied, we see major differences I don't think I'll have the time to elaborate on this today, however. So to summarize, just to, to put it in a, in a, in a uh, structured way, uh, what are today the main challenges and priorities for open science? It is, um, I caricature here a bit, a structure. So it is open access to scholarly publications. Uh, these are the areas we're working on. It's the early sharing of all research outputs, out, all research outputs meaning uh, uh, data, this is data sets, we meaning software, mean algorithms, meaning models, meaning you know ev everything that it is a research output, especially the research outputs that can be digital, and therefore it's far easier to share. It means that um, uh, all data and other outputs need to become fair, so findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, which means that research data management uh, has or research output management, some people say. Uh, needs to uh, receive increased importance. Uh, we have in the uh, last uh, couple of years started to tackle the area of reproducibility. Uh, the uh, scientific results that are reproducible, of course, are of much higher value because they are trusted and you can build upon. And then finally, societal engagement responsibilities. Responsibility, these are the main five areas where we need to improve the practice of uh, research and innovation. But in addition to improving the practice, we need to develop the right enablers. We need to support the development of open science. Uh, I talked already about rewards and incentives uh, that uh, otherwise open science cannot advance, cannot advance quickly at least. We need to uh, develop the appropriate skills uh, the, um, and therefore we need the appropriate curricula, the appropriate education. We need, this is also a very important area of activity for the institutions, for the universities, the research centers. And we need to develop whatever infrastructures are needed in order to underpin, to support the new paradigm for doing science. So in the era communication that I said was, as I said earlier, was published on the 30th of September, of uh, last year, there is there are parts devoted to open science, in particular under the deepening the European research area section. Uh, there are four uh, actions under deepening the area related to open science. One is about uh, launching a platform of peer-reviewed open access publishing, which now has been done. It was launched on 24th of March and it's called ORE. Um, open Research Europe. So it is it is a platform for peer-reviewed scientific publications in the beginning by uh, those publications that arise out of Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe funding. Second action is to analyze copyright, author's right, uh, across the European Union to see what is the situation in each country and to see where we could do uh, improvements that will facilitate uh, the sharing of publicly funded peer-reviewed articles. Third action was to continue building the open science cloud uh, as an infrastructure supporting open science. And uh, finally, again, the issue of the research assessment system that the commission uh, recognizes that it is essential to reform. There's another section in the communication about citizen engagement and bringing science closer to the citizen. Uh, and with a number of actions that are proposed, including citizen science campaigns uh, uh, to raise awareness and networking, crowdsourcing platforms, pan-European hackathons, and so on. And this will be done uh, in the context of uh, the Horizon Europe missions that are currently in development, uh, I, as you may know. 
uh, in the context of the oceans, clean oceans uh, mission, there is already uh, an activity that is starting uh, about the so-called plastic pirates, about cleaning, cleaning the oceans, our oceans from plastics with the help of citizens. And in the ERA roadmap, uh, there, are, there, is, there are concrete, uh, there's a roadmap for uh, two actions uh, about the um, EUSC, uh, the European Open Science Cloud, uh, which uh, we have, we are starting a European partnership uh, this year, we are ready to go. Uh, the um, uh, EOSC Association has been created in the summer last year and has brought together all uh, actors in Europe. So uh, funders, um, academies, uh, universities, all the research, all other research performers, uh, together with uh, service providers like e-infrastructures, for example, computing centers. Uh, so it will be a partnership between this association bringing together all actors on the one hand and the European Commission and the member states of the EU uh, on the other hand. This partnership will implement the EUSC strategic research agenda of which you can only already find in the internet um, uh, the, the first version that has been adopted. The other action that is detailed is the reform of the research assessment system. We started in March with a wide-ranging consultation on, uh, uh, by, uh, we had a meeting in Brussels with about 110 uh, organizations, mostly research performing organizations, but also uh, funders, research funders from uh, across Europe. Uh, and we continue uh, with through bilateral organizations. The aim is to present a paper in October or November uh, this year, outlining a way forward for uh, coming up with uh, an initiative to reform research assessment that would be, uh, we think of it as a kind of an MOU, a memorandum of understanding that uh, where research funders and research performers would commit to specific actions on how to reform the research assessment system so as to modernize it and to provide incentives and rewards for open science and for collaboration. Okay, let me uh, just elaborate a little bit on this, on uh, why uh, we give so much emphasis on the reform of the um, assessment, the research assessment system. It is because we find that the current system does not correspond to how we think about science uh, should be, or about how open science should be. So we have the current system, uh, and, and we do see a positive change, but it is, has been quite slow, very slow over the last 10 or 15 years. So we see still today that the dominant system is such that it rewards individual competing scientists rather than rewarding also collaboration and sharing, which is the basis of open science. Uh, you, we all know the publish or perish culture, publish as fast and as, and as much as possible. Uh, without, um, which leads to major issues about research quality, reproducibility of results. Uh, today, we have the system with the GIF factors that everybody blames, but, uh, but it's so difficult to move away from, uh, whereby excellence is basically defined or rewarded on the base of where you publish, which generally you publish, rather on what you published. We need to go towards more composite definitions of uh, quality or excellence. Um, we need to provide rewards to researchers to produce um, outputs of all sorts that are useful to others. Uh, so including data sets, for instance, where, uh, whereas now uh, we incentivize mainly the production of publications and so on. So the, we need to make a transition from one system to another this will take uh, a number of years, of course, but we would like to structure and accelerate this progress, this process, at least in Europe. So this is now about open science and the horizon Europe. Uh, th this is the last part. Uh, I would like to, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be more brief here. Um, so what is the main issue uh, about open science and horizon Europe? We have started dealing with aspects of open science already in framework programs since 2007, 2008, with the framework program seven, uh, where we started with a pilot on open access to publications, which then was extended to, uh, to it became mandatory and then was extended with a pilot to data. And then open access to data became uh, the default, but we had exceptions. And then now in 2021, 
13 or 14 years after we started, we try to do, go the you know, full mile to mainstream open science across all aspects of Horizon Europe. What does it mean open all aspects? It means that uh, in the evaluation proposals, in the drafting of proposals, first of all, then in the evaluation proposals, we already have in the grant agreements uh, that of, of Horizon Europe specific uh, terms um, that are related to open science within our guidelines for, uh, for the executing the projects in the reporting of projects and of course in the work programs. So across Horizon Europe, we want to mainstream open science. So in terms of open access, uh, we have two or three major differences. One is that we have now immediate uh, open access and obligation, no more embargoes as in the past. Uh, secondly, uh, we, we need to ensure the position at the time of the publication of all publications, even those that are uh, in, uh, in open access journals to a trusted repository. Uh, and we need to provide uh, the uh, to, and we need the authors or their institutions to retain sufficient intellectual property rights in order to be able to satisfy their open access obligations. So they need to use open licenses like uh, CC BY or equivalent for scientific papers. In terms of research data, uh, we uh, the, the the principle will continue to be as in the past that uh, in terms of openness, that as open as possible, as close as necessary. In other words, default is open, but that uh, you can uh, close it if you have good reasons to close it. And there can be many good reasons to close it, to close the, the data up. But you need to be specific on why you need to have, or you want to have, or at least for a period, the, um, the data closed. Uh, we'll, uh, all data, however, will need to be fair. Uh, all data sets will need to be fed. In other words, they need to be provided with the persistent uh, uh, identifiers. And we will require, as in the past, but this will be a more general requirement now with more concrete guidance, data management plans for all projects, and generally will cultivate the uh, a culture of responsible uh, research data management. And this was about data, but it will be similar, although it's not gonna be a legal obligation, but a strong recommendation for all other outputs as well. In other words, what we do with data, that they need to be deposited, that they need to be able to find them, one will be able to find them afterwards to be accessible, um, reusable, and so on. This is true also for software. Uh, it's true for any other output, uh, algorithms, uh, and so on. The, um, uh, we also have a specific provision about reproducibility that uh, even when the data are closed, if uh, the, um, the, uh, there is a publication uh, out coming out of an Horizon Europe project and uh, some uh, member of the uh, scientists wants to check the validity or the, um, uh, the reproducibility of its conclusions, uh, he or she is entitled to ask uh, permission for access from the authors of the publication, and they have to provide, unless there are very good reasons that they cannot provide it, they need to provide access to the to the data or to the software or whatever else is necessary in order to validate the conclusions of this publication. So these are the open science practices that uh, we, we like to see in uh, proposals from uh, the open access to open sharing to output management, peer review, uh, reproducibility and so on, and this will be evaluated also uh, as part of the proposal. So there are two uh, there are two criteria in the evaluation of uh, normal uh, Horizon Europe projects under the quality. The quality of open science practice will be evaluated under the excellence criterion, under in, to be exact under the methodology of that criterion. This according to the philosophy that the um, that open science is a new way of doing science and a better way of doing science. Therefore, it has to do with the methods of doing science. So open science practice will be evaluated under excellence, but also in the other criterion that has to do with the quality and efficiency of the implementation. Also, there may be aspects of open science to be evaluated. Uh, <clears throat> for example, through the kind of information that, uh, uh, that proposers uh, put in their CVs. Uh, so for instance, if they have a good track record in sharing things, uh, in publishing data sets, uh, for instance, the, or, um, or having their publication under open access, this would be taken into account. So I need to stop here.
25 minutes. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this uh, very enlightening and, and rich presentation. We will be taking questions uh, in order for you to answer, but at the end of uh, the, the different interventions. So I will now leave the floor to our next uh, in, uh, speaker. Um, so I believe uh, Sylvie Rousset, you can share uh, your screen. Uh, thanks for this uh, invitation. Um, I'm Sylvie Rousset, I'm the head of the Department for Open Research Data at CNRS. So we are in charge of open science at CNRS. So I've, I will, um, first I want to um, say that CNRS is a research performing organization. I put here a few key numbers. CNRS in a few numbers, I said uh, the number of people, the budget, and we are performing research uh, within 1000 research units. And we are dealing with excellence in research and our production is about uh, 50,000 articles per year, which we, you can find in the web of science plus um, article for human and social science. So in um, starting after the, the, the national plan for open science in France was launched by the Ministry of Research in uh, 2018, we have launched our own roadmap for open science in November 2019. And more recently, we also have launched a plan for um, research data in order to share or data. So you can find this um, document, which is uh, the strategy, the open science policy at CNRS on our website, and you can find them in, in English, of course. Then we have also la launched an open access monitoring just to know how much, how many publications are in open access at CNRS. Uh, also compared to what is in open access in France. So you can see um, the numbers. So it, this number refer to um, the publication which are published by all the researcher inside the units of CNRS. Our units are in general shared with other institutions like universities. It is um, specific in France. So here we are referring to all the, the, the units where the CNRS uh, is involved. And in 2019, we have about 67% of open access, which is higher than in France, 56%, but it's not the crucial point I want to highlight. But you see there are colors. So what is colored is the open access. And we, uh, we can even uh, recognize uh, what is the way you access to this publication. Uh, yellow is only for the editor, where you, you have to pay um, article processing charge. And more often, it's the author it, himself who is paying this, this processing charge. So we are not completely in favor to that because it's, it's uh, an additional amount of money. Uh, in green, you have the, the way uh, it is accessible through the open archive. And when you have this two colors, it's that is common uh, between these two ways. And what is the specificity of CNRS is that among this 67 uh, open access percentage, you have 91% which is accessible via the open archives, which means that our researchers um, are now uh, well used to deposit um, in specifically or, or national archive, which is HAL. Um, you can see here, sorry, is that okay? Yeah. yeah, HAL is the French Open Archive Repository. And well, policy started two years ago is to, to ask that it is now mandatory for senior researcher to deposit their publication into HAL. And uh, last year, it was even mandatory to deposit 
the entire text. And you see the graph uh, below, and it's from the, the, the beginning of, of the Open Archive HAL 20 years ago. And now the policy, the effect of the policy in the two last years is that there is an increase of the number of publications that are deposited into HAL. So if we want to have a significant amount of open publication, it is necessary to have um, such a policy. And I think it is um, going on in other institutions also in France and maybe all over in Europe also. And so this was the, the policy about um, open archive, but I want to say that in order to achieve 100% of open access, our strategy is not only a national open archive, but also what we call the bibliodiversity, which is also the main message that the ministry uh, want to put forward. So we still are negotiating with uh, commercial or non-commercial publisher. We want to enhance bibliodiversity also by um, there is sustainable preprint servers, and we recommend also to use the, the, the server of preprints so that you can deposit your publication uh, very quickly. And alternative publications are uh, alter open platform edition. And for example, um, here are a list of uh, virtuous platform publication, like Copernicus publication. Um, 8,000 is the platform that has been retained by the European community to, 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 um, to be the, the, the European platform where people can deposit their publication issue from the project research that are financed by the community, the European community. So um, PCI is, is a very uh, nice uh, recommendation platform. And we also worked about overlay journal, which are that because for researchers, it is very important to still have the referring by their pair. Um, this is a, um, a guarantee for the quality of the paper. And therefore we want also to, to encourage this way of open publication. So these were my main messages on open publication. And um, also we have been engaged in the, the subject of changing evaluation uh, to take into account more open science criteria. Um, like many institutions, the CNRS has signed the declaration of DORA in July, 2018. It means that for institution, what is the much more important thing is the scientific content of the paper and not the metrics or the, uh, you know, there is a journal impact factor, which we do not recommend to use anymore. And the second aspect is that we encourage that all research output are taken into account for assessment, including data set software and also preprint and other things. So we have uh, put forward uh, four principles to address this, but maybe I don't go into detail for that. I will leave you this presentation. I want also to uh, take a few words about the, the, the subject of opening and sharing the research data. And as it was um, uh, recalled before, and this is the main um, purpose for, uh, inside the European community also, it's not the question of opening the data. It has to be open, as open as possible, as close as necessary. The more important thing is that data has to be um, somewhere where we can find them, uh, even the, search, the researcher uh, wants to, to, to find his research data uh, a, a few years later. It is very important. A lot of data are, are, are just um, 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 not found anymore. So it, they are lost. So it's, it's, it's really a question of culture. We have to de develop an open change culture. And for this, we have also developed inside CNRS uh, some services. We can provide um, identifier for uh, research data, which are digital open 
open identifier like for publication and we can help for data management plan and so on we make some training event and finally um, i will uh, stop here and thank you very much for your attention Thank you very much uh, for this uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, for the people attending the conference, please don't hesitate to ask your questions in the chat. And we will be taking questions, a couple of them. Unfortunately, you won't have time to, to take all your big questions uh, following the last intervention. So please, Alexander, I think uh, you will also be sharing your screen. Thanks a lot. And uh, thanks for having me. My name is Alexander Beresko. I am. Uh, manager of Optima project and representative of Lviv Polytechnic National University, Ukraine. Um, just two words. Our university is the oldest technical higher education institution in Ukraine and Eastern Europe. It was founded in 1816. And today it's also one of the top uh, Ukrainian universities and the biggest one. Just quick facts. Um, I'm here to present Optima project. Optima stands for Open Practices, Transparency and Integrity for Modern Academia. It is a three-year capacity building project, which is carried out with the support of the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union. Its main goal is introducing contemporary open science practices to Ukraine um, to boost transparency and integrity to improve higher education quality. Um, the Polytechnic National University is coordinator of this project. So, um, Optima's general goal is actually indeed bringing open science to Ukraine, and um, we see um, open science as innovative means of improving education quality. Um, so what is the problem we are trying to resolve? First of all, let me describe the Optima Consortium. So uh, as you can see, the consortium is relatively big and widespread across Europe. In program countries, we have three higher education institutions and two international non-governmental organizations. In Ukraine, we have four higher education institutions, governmental agency and a research center. So here you can see uh, our program country partners and of course, University Code d'Azur. Um, and here you can see our Ukrainian consortium partners. Uh, please note that National Antarctic Scientific Center of Ukraine is also a partner and I will get back to this later. So the problem, um, unfortunately today, the system of higher education in Ukraine is characterized by serious deficiencies such as inefficient quality assurance and low levels of internationalization, which negatively affects educational attainment and reduces the country's general potential. Hence, radical modernization of Ukrainian higher education has been recognized as an urgent need to improve its quality, strengthen the ability to contribute to the country's intellectual and innovative capacity, as well as accelerate European integration in the context of Ukrainian European Union Association Agreement and the Bologna process. At the same time, uh, another acute problem currently facing the Ukraine's higher education system is caused by the military conflict in Eastern Ukraine. Um, in 2014, the concept of displaced higher education institution emerged, as since the beginning of hostilities in the Donbass region, 18 universities have been moved from the temporarily seized territories. The displaced higher education institutions managed to resume their educational process, but continue to struggle with infrastructure funding and human resource problems, in addition to other common issues of the Ukrainian higher education system. Despite the obstacles, Ukraine has embarked on an ambitious process of political reform. Uh, reformers are making efforts to increase transparency, accountability, and integrity of government institutions including higher education ones. Unfortunately, full implementation of these vital reforms is a highly demanding process due to a lack of recognition for values of academic integrity in Ukraine, as well as widespread disbelief in the need for change at the local level. 
Um, the above mentioned facts provide clear evidence for a systemic problem which limits the capacity of tangible progress in education quality, which the existing means and tools in Ukraine. We conclude that there is a need for development and implementation of innovative quality assurance mechanisms built of academic integrity culture. Uh, let me stress that uh, integrity is based on the fundamental principle of transparency, which is defined as one of the 14 ethical principles in education and research. Transparency is celebrated as the most important principle alongside integrity in the guidance documents of contemporary scientific and educational communities. Um, it is obvious to us that transparency and openness are the key ingredients to build and spread integrity culture based on trust. We understand that such a process of change requires time, especially when dealing with the inert Ukrainian academic system, however, there is an urgent need to start. Fortunately, we didn't have to look for the role model as long and big things are hard to miss. Transparency is also at the core of open science, the global movement which is rapidly developing and has gained increasing European level recognition um, and popularity in recent years. Uh, at the European Union level, Open science is part of the policy, official policy. Um, so compared to the European Union, which is making ambitious steps towards open science, in Ukraine, unfortunately, it is still in the infant stage. However, we conclude that the open science vacuum should be treated not as a failure, but as an opportunity to use the constantly improving European open science best practices to finally get the situation in Ukraine off the ground. Um, we conducted two surveys uh, among early career researchers in Ukraine in 2018 and 2020. As you can see, a relatively big number of researchers participated in it. So uh, here you can see several numbers which demonstrate the uptake on open science in Ukraine. So blue uh, column represents people, researchers who haven't heard and haven't practiced open science. Orange is people, researchers, who um, have heard about open science, and gray is people who have heard and have practiced. As you can see, there is a slow progress, but unfortunately not among uh, the early career researchers. And uh, let's say experienced researchers are more open to open science in Ukraine. So uh, we decided to focus on early career research. So the general strategy of the project is introduction of more open and transparent practices, leading to increased academic integrity, leading to improved educational quality. Uh, the open science roadmap is sure diverse. It's an umbrella term uh, which encapsulates many different practices from open access, of course, open publishing, and open science evaluation, reproducible research, and uh, et cetera. However, we think that introduction of open peer review has the biggest potential in Ukraine as it brings transparency to the already familiar practice of academic evaluation and provides hands-on learning opportunities, especially for early career researchers. Then during the doctoral training, helping to build new skills and the collective mentorship of international experts. Hence, we plan to develop and implement an online open peer review platform for academic conferences and build an international virtual community of peer reviewers and researchers on the base of it. Um, yes, combined with um, courses, with general and subject specific open science subjects to be introduced in the partner higher education institutions for master students and PhD candidates, as well as open uh, online course on open science available for everyone. Um, we aim at giving our target universities and Ukrainian higher education system in general a much needed impetus for change towards openness and integrity. Hence, we consider open practices as a quality assurance process and its technological backbone, the open peer review platform and virtual community of experts and reviewers as a quality assurance mechanism. 
uh, regarding open peer review, uh, we also have conducted a special survey also in 2018 and 2020. And, and as you can see, uh, dark blue color represents Ukrainian researchers who haven't heard of open peer review and haven't participated in it. Um, orange represents people who, uh, researchers who have heard. Uh, gray is people who participated in open peer review as also and reviewer, yellow as author only, and blue as a reviewer only. As you can see, uh, level of uptake on open peer review in Ukraine is also much bigger among the experienced researchers. So uh, focus on early career researchers is again justified. Um, we had identified the main obstacles of open peer review implementation in Ukraine. So uh, this is lack of recognition for reviewers, but uh, to be honest, this is <laughs> a problem which is common to researchers all over Europe inertia of Ukrainian academic community and lack of technology. And we try to uh, help with at least the last point and introduce open peer review platforms. We are not starting from scratch as we have already had a pilot system, which was launched in Ukraine several years ago, which is called Open Review Hub. And we have already used it for support of several academic conferences. Last but not least, uh, climate change uh, is also part of optimal project. And we try to, uh, let's say, connect open science and climate action in order to help with this extremely important point. Uh, open data is crucial for um, open um, climate change action all over the world. And I highly recommend presentation but by uh, Dr. Svetlana Krakowska our team member and uh, senior researcher at National Antarctic Center of Ukraine regarding this important connection and issue. Please use this QR code or this link to see the presentation. Uh, I also invite you to follow our project's social media channels on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube to stay connected and stay tuned and let's say uh, get all the uh, updates regarding our project. So uh, thanks a lot for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, I would be uh, very happy to answer them. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for uh, your presentation. So uh, we uh, have rounded up the presentation for today. Actually, there was uh, supposed to be a last presentation in order to give an example of tool, which was the Open Science uh, Charter. But uh, because we are at a tight schedule, we have decided not to make this presentation in order to take uh, at least one or two questions from uh, the audience. Uh, so I will take one question. So this question is for uh, Mr. Guignos, so for Costas. Um, so since research communities are often international and for researchers, evaluation from the community is fundamental, to what extent is the change of paradigm that you have uh, presented in research assessments supported by Europe sh is shared by the nation strong in research like the US or China, for instance? Yes, thank you. It's a, it's a good question. Uh, we are, as I said, we're, in, we're working at all levels. So the, uh, this change is not going to happen uh, unless uh, we uh, address open science at the um, local, institutional, as well as uh, national European level and more and more at the international level. So the, um, the, uh, we see, especially with the pandemic, we see a very strong move towards open science recently. Uh, I said in the beginning of my speech that there has been the last three days at the UNESCO meeting on open science recommendations. It's fascinating to see uh, the debate between uh, countries from uh, uh, Ghana, Russia, uh, many of the European countries, uh, China, and so on, on issues like uh, you know how to share data uh, and going down to the uh, to great depth and detail showing that these people that represent their countries in UNESCO have very detailed appropriate briefings about science. I was impressed. 
to be honest. So uh, we we see a lot of uh, we see a lot of progress. Uh, it is not only um, on only UNESCO, of course. It's just an example. We have in the G7 group of countries uh, a, an open science working group. The open science working group just a few weeks ago that it had this recent meeting decided to dedicate work in 2022 and 23 on among uh, on two or three issues, among which is the um, rewards and incentives for open science or the reform of uh, career assessment. Uh, we have more specialized areas, uh, uh, sorry, for international like the Research Data Alliance or the CODATA or the International Science Council under which is CODATA that also address um, uh, open science and all various aspects of open science. So yes, we are going international um, uh, uh, to, the, to, the, to the full extent possible. Now, US, I think it's uh, very much um, uh, along the same lines. It's a bit different in the US always because it's a big country with many funding agencies. Um, there are always particularities in the US or in, uh, in any other country, but they are on the same, on the same more or less um, um, uh, line, policy line. We, we are very much in agreement with them on the basic issues. China is a bit more um, difficult. Uh, they are on the same line also. So the UNESCO will go with uh, the recommendation. I mean, I advise you to read it once it's published. Um, but um, uh, the, uh, I believe that China will consent to all aspects of it at the end. They are active in the, in the discussions. Uh, but uh, yes, I would, I would suppose that China is more close to the current or to the, um, to the incumbent paradigm for, uh, for um, uh, the way science is being undertaken, giving a lot of attention to um, to, for example, bibliometric indicators of uh, articles and uh, the like that we would like to get away from. Thank you very much for your answer. Maybe uh, one last question, an open question to our three uh, speakers. Uh, we've heard a lot the, the, the words incentives, reward, but also obligation. And in your opinion, what would be the right balance between incentive an obligation in order to actually enhance and make sure open science is uh, well received and implemented at, uh, among the research communities. I mean, open science as anything else will be only successful if it's owned by those who practice it, uh, and uh, which implies a change of culture eventually. So to have a change of culture, this needs to be a bottom up again eventually. So uh, if I had to choose between the two, I would tell you um, uh, incentives and rewards is, uh, is uh, very important, is far more important. However, uh, the, um, especially the beginning, top-down actions um, to, um, to uh, regarding a policy like we do in Horizon Europe, for example, imposing on uh, uh, funding agencies across Europe imposing some constraints like that you do have to publish open access or that you do have to share your data or publish your data and uh, things like that uh, will also will also be essential. Also essential will be to make these things possible because the, um, uh, if, uh, if the, um, uh, you have the policies from the funders or you have the will from the researchers, but you don't have the infrastructures. So you want to make your data open, but you don't find appropriate repositories, for instance, that have the right policies and things like that. Yes, then of course it's uh, useless. So you need to do the to address the problem for all angles, infrastructures, uh, reforming the rewards and assessment system, as well as have concrete policies from uh, uh, funders and institutions. Thank you. Uh, does Sylvie or Alexander want also to give uh, Alexander, I think? Uh, yes, uh, both of them said so just one, one last word. Let's start with Sylvie and then we'll have the closing argument from uh, Alexander. Uh, okay, maybe just one sentence is to say that if you, if you want to increase, for example, the number of open access publication going from 20% to 80%, it is proven that you have to, to have some constraint and to make a, a kind of mandatory policy. So um, I think uh, that's the reason why we, we try to, to mix between uh, incentive and, and, and mandatory sometimes, but researchers are, are willing to do it in, in the end, I would say.
Thank you. And Alexander? Just one small comment. Uh, I also like initiatives very much, but um, if you don't have the right policy, I mean, from ministry, from uh, funding agency, whatever else, you just can't practice this. So there should be a balance, and I second previous the speaker for the thanks. Thank you very much. So there were two other questions that we didn't have uh, the chance to uh, ask, but uh, we we will send the the, the answers uh, by email. Uh, only one on one note. Uh, there was one specific question concerning the UBCU's open archive. So as I mentioned in my introduction, within the Compass project, which will be designing the research and innovation strategy of UBCU, there is a big pillar actually dedicated to open science. So actually all options and different options uh, will be considered. It will be considered among the research community, of course, of uh, UBCUS and the staff of UBCUS, uh, but uh, no door is closed. The idea is, uh, again, uh, to ins be inspired by the European uh, Commission policies and by uh, very successful uh, initiatives such as the ones that were presented through Optima Project and the CNRS. So again, I would like to thank all three speakers today for uh, actually their, uh, their, their commitments and their support to the UDCUS project uh, for their expertise and knowledge so, uh, sharing, uh, which is uh, very coherent with uh, open science. Um, and uh, I invite all uh, other participants to please go back to the B2B match platform. Now it's time for a one-to-one -one, um, meetings and uh, the next sessions of uh, the, the UDCU's open events. Thank you very much uh, for your participation.